Hello, this is Parula Malmqvist, fire protection engineer and former battalion chief. I've made a video about lithium-ion battery fires for Swedish fire brigades, where I've tried to interpret science reports and also made some test fires to demonstrate what I've learned. Since battery fire is a topic all over the world, I thought I'd make an English version as well. My view is that battery fires, just like house fires, can look very different from one another, and we need more than one possible method to handle them. And that method will be based on what is burning, what is exposed, if there are lives to save, etc., etc. To develop those methods, we need knowledge about the different variables and what they mean from a firefighting perspective. This video is supposed to be a little help in that process. With that said, the thing I th talk about here are my views. They are based on science and my own experiments. But before accepting what I say, you must talk to your employer and make risk assessments for the methods you want to try or use. Battery fires can both produce instant jet flames and there can be much electrical energy in a battery pack. And before starting the presentation, here is the content of it. You can see what the times are and if, if you want to go to a certain part of it. And now we start the presentation. Enjoy and be safe. I would like to talk about the battery and what it contains. This is a battery cell. And uh, of course, it contains electrical energy. It can be a lot of electrical energy if it's uh, full, and if it's empty, there is a little bit less electrical energy. And there is a, an electrolyte that is a flammable liquid that contains carbon, fluorine, hydrogen, and lithium ions. And the interesting part here is that uh, the electrolyte contains, that's the chemical energy, and that contains about 70% of the total energy of a battery. So the electrical energy is only like 30% of it. There is a weather protection, and why should I mention that here? Well, because what I've learned the last year is that sometimes there can form lithium metal within the, the battery cell. Uh, and the weather protection makes uh, protection from extinguishing water it, with a flood of battery, for example. Lithium metal that normally reacts with water uh, is because of the we uh, weather protection of the battery casing, that is. There is no uh, problem from a fire and rescue perspective. Also, if we have a fire or a thermal runaway in the battery cell, the lithium metal will burn away. So that is good information to know. Uh, also, we have oxides, and oxides uh, are the things that makes it possible for lithium ion batteries to burn without any other oxygen present from the air. There is a lot of other different chemicals that, that will uh, affect toxicity of smoke, for example, but we know it is a toxic smoke, so we'll leave it with that uh, for now. If we look at this video from the Finnish Fire Academy, they made a test with uh, one cubic meter space with a uh, lithium ion battery in thermal runaway and an aerosol extinguisher deployed. And you saw this explosion. It's a very strong explosion they succeeded in showing here. So what is it is that is causing this kind of explosion? Well, the, the DNV Global uh, made a study on the gases uh, that is produced by lithium ion batteries in an inert atmosphere. Uh, and what they found was that 30% is hydrogen. 7 to 30 percent is carbon monoxide, 2 to 15 percent is methane, uh, and many more gases than that that is uh, combustible. And over time, if each cell produces a thermal event and you don't get a flame from that but only the smoke, 
then those uh, flammable gases will eventually reach up to the lower explosive limits. If we look at the explosive limits for three of the things that is produced in a thermal runaway, we have uh, the explosion limit for hydrogen that is between 4 and 74 percent, carbon monoxide between 12 and 75 percent, and methane between 4.4 and 16 percent. So we have a very wide span where we can have uh, explosions in th those gases. If we then continue to look at the temperature where you get an auto ignition, because uh, if you look at videos of, of burning batteries, you can see that in the beginning, a lot of time there are only smoke and then at some point they ignite. Uh, and that is because the surface area where the smoke is coming out from, from the battery pack or the module needs to be above the, the lowest auto ignition temperatures of the different substances uh, within. And also from the DNV Global study, they found that ethanol is the substance with the lowest auto ignition temperature. 365 degrees C or 690 degrees F. Also state of charge seems important. I will get back to that more in detail, uh, but if we have a high state of charge, we will more probably have an immediate combustion of the flammable gases. If we have a low state of charge, we will have no gases and no flames at all, and a medium state of charge will produce a lot of unburnt combustible gases. Uh, so that is one way of looking at it. If you look at a fire uh, from a lithium-ion battery pack or module and you see a lot of smoke, then it's probably combustible gases. If you have a flame, then those gases are uh, combusting, so we don't have the problem with explosions in that case. I spoke about the Norwegians and their car ferry, Ytoøyning, where they have a major explosion in the battery room. Well, a while later they had a new battery ferry that got a thermal runaway in the battery room. Uh, and they did a very careful and, and good planning of how they were going to handle this so they would get an explosion again. Uh, and what they did, they created an inlet and an outlet to the battery room because they, they didn't have that. They did not enter the battery room. Instead, they first, through one of the inlet, uh, flushed it with nitrogen and then they ventilated it in a pace that made you always kept an inert atmosphere within the battery room. And that was a success that operation. So we know that the explosion risks are real. Uh, some options exist, however, for the, for the fire and rescue services. We can inert closed spaces before ventilation and in that way prevent explosions from happening. If it's possible, we can ventilate early and continuously to keep an atmosphere below the lo lower explosive limit. We can treat confined spaces with battery fires like they can explode. And by doing that, we can define hazardous areas and make restrictions for them. And flame and combustion, as I said, can be an advantage, but it can give other downsides. So, so that's something you have to consider from case to case. During my test fires, I, I burned a lot of both cells and modules. And one thing I noted was how hard it is to ignite a battery cell. In this case, we have 300 centigrades at the battery cell. I had that for seven minutes, or actually in this case, I had it for 29 minutes before I got this result here. The safety valve started to open uh, and you can see they're bubbling from the safety valve. And what's happening now is that the safety valve releases, it flies away uh, and you will have a flaming explosion from this battery or a flaming fire. 
and the state of charge on this battery was 90 percent so it was a high state of charge you will not see the flames but they were uh, above what the camera was uh, showing here i then made other tests where it only took seven minutes when i removed the plastic cover on the battery so to learn from this is that the battery cell that is burning it's not like gasoline in an open canister that you only need a spark or a small fire getting close to it this is much harder to uh, get started one of those lithium-ion battery fires uh, and this slow start in some cases uh, can we use and take advantage of and there are several fire scenarios with batteries that will start slow and we can use this slow starting fire by acting and preparing for a growing battery fire even if nothing is showing on arrival because i suspect we will get a number of calls fire calls where we get to the scene nothing showing they have said there have been some some popping from the battery or or some smoke even and when we get there there is nothing showing and that time is a good time to do something because it will either advance and become a more uh, developing fire or it will uh, stop there because many batteries are designed to be able to handle one cell failure we can move the vehicle or the battery to a place where it, it's uh, not as bad for the environment, either for people, for buildings or for other objects. We can make a plan to limit the fire spread and start implementing that plan. We can prepare to handle the smoke from the battery fire. And we can do that by getting the PPV fans out we can close open doors if it's in, inside a building depending on what you want to achieve with the the ventilation efforts and you can set up smoke blockers if you have any of those to to seal certain openings and you can enclose the burning item in a fire blanket i will talk more about fire blankets later in this video There are a couple of different designs of battery cells. To the left we have a cylindrical cell and in the middle we have a prismatic cell and on the right we have a pouch cell. And that design matters in how they react to fire when they're within a battery module. The thing is that they are all built basically the same way. You have some sheets of a cathode and electrolyte you have an anode and you have an insulating layer. Uh, and then what you do with those layers after that depends on what the battery cell will look like. In this case, upper right, I'm trying to rolling it to a cylindrical cell. On the upper left, I'm making a pouch cell by just placing them on top of each other. And in the middle below, I'm making a prismatic cell by folding it in a little bit uh, wider way. But it's the same kind of thing inside the batteries. It's all about uh, then how much electrolyte and anode and cathode each cell contains. Here is a video where I take a battery apart after discharging it to, to see if I could see what it looked like inside. And you see some graphite powder here, and you see some kind of coppery thing. And you can see how it's rolled of those different layers. So those cells, we take and we place them in battery modules. And depending on the design of the battery cell, we will have a different look on the battery modules. And this will affect firefighting a lot what the battery modules look like. Here we have the cylindrical, the prismatic and the pouch cells in different setup. The modules are then placed in battery packs and they can vary a lot in design as well. And this kind of battery design affects the fire. If we have large cells 
That means we have a longer duration of flames and or smoke when they have a thermal runaway. Uh, if we have less air between cells and a denser packing of them, that gives a faster spread of the propagation between the cells. And also, of course, harder for water to reach and cool unburned cell if we flood the battery. The distance between the modules might be a help because if the cells are densely packed, then there will probably be more distance between the modules. And if we flood a battery and we have that distance, it might be that the, the thermal runaway between the cells, the propagation of it stops between the modules. Less that I have learned from the fires I have burned now for, for doing this video is they take a long time to handle battery fires. No matter if they are extinguished quickly or not, they take a long time. Because if they're extinguished quickly, we still have a lot of work afterwards in deciding what to do with the battery and how to handle the remains of it. This is an important thing. Here I uh, start a thermal runaway in a couple of battery cells at one end of this battery module. It's a home-built home battery module with a very bad design since I have a sheet metal on top of the safety valves, which means the flames will go affecting the non-burnt uh, cells in a very bad way. That's why we get this fast spread from cell to cell. But what we see here is that we have phases of thermal runaway, and then we have phases with just a regular fire burning. Now we have no thermal uh, runaway going right now. And then after a while, when that cell is heated, we get a new thermal runaway, and then it's over. And we have some time in between there, and in the beginning of a fire, this time will be pretty pretty long. And that's the time we can use. Here we have a thermal runaway again in a cell. And then we have, after that, we have a regular fire. And if you want to stop the propagation of the thermal events, you want to keep the cells below 170 degrees uh, centigrade. One thing we hear a lot is that it is impossible to extinguish a battery fire. And that could be right and it could be wrong, because it all depends on what we're talking about, like the battery. If we talk at the battery cell, yes, that is right. Uh, during that short phase of thermal runaway, it is uh, impossible to put it out from a fire and rescue perspective. But if we look at it on a module level or on a battery pack level, we certainly can affect the propagation of the thermal runaway. And, and that is very important to know. So I think this is a misunderstanding saying that it is impossible to put out a battery fire. Because researchers and people who have stated this, they're talking about cell level. We at the fire brigade need to talk about module or battery pack level. And in that case, we, we certainly can do a lot of things. So to put out the battery fire, we need to know that part of the time is just a regular fire. Plastics and flammable liquids burning. Nothing, nothing strange at all about that. Parts of the time is a thermal runaway. And that one we can't do anything about. Uh, parts of the time, it's evaporation of plastics and a flammable liquid inside a container. That one we also can do something about. One thing that we always should consider is to let it burn, because that might be the fastest way to, to have it handled. And if we don't want to do that, but we want to handle the incident, we can stop the heating of unburned cells by extinguishing or cooling what is burning. We can find openings in the battery pack and spray water into it. And in this case, precision is more important than high flow rate. Because I think a high flow rate and a high pressure can make it harder to get into the battery openings we, we might be able to find. And we can use tools made for flooding battery packs. 
there is a couple of temperatures that are good to know. One of them is 130 degrees C, 266F, which is when the pressure relief valve opens on a cylindrical battery. The other one is 150 to 170 degrees C, 300 to 400 F, when we will get the thermal runaway starting somewhere around those temperatures. Uh, and the other one is uh, the boiling point of water, 100 degrees C, 212 degrees F. And that is why flooding the battery is a good option, if it's possible. Because the maximum temperature of water in, in uh, normal pressure is well below the 150 that is needed for a thermal runaway. So is it possible? To put this out, I think it's three modules we have there, and the water flow rate is uh, 10 gallons per minute. Uh, and the answer is yes, it was possible. And what I did was I uh, have uh, six battery modules, uh, about three kilowatt hours of uh, energy. Uh, I put them in a metal container and I had thermocouples on those to see on both on the outside and on the inside of each module to, to be able to see read temperature and see which. And then I put a lid on the box and I started a fire in the modules. Uh, and all the thermocouples now are, are uh, except for one that are at a higher level. We have a pop first from the, the battery cell popping, and then we have an, had another pop. And that's when I started the 10 minute timer because I thought 10 minutes will be a reasonable time for the fire brigade to get there. And I just observed and let this uh, propagate. And as you can see, it is a very slow event in the beginning. Some things happen and then it stops for a while and then it happens again. So what, what you see here now is, is that we're starting to get more and more heat. And if we look at the thermocouple readings, we can see that in many modules we still have like 30 degrees centigrade, which is uh, just above the external temperature. Uh, so the heat transfer from one module to another is, is uh, quite slow here, even though uh, they are densely stacked and we have this uh, thermal event going on. Now we're getting closer to the, to the end here the 10 minute mark since we have had two small pops smoke coming from the battery pack uh, and we will start flooding it. Uh, again looking at the thermocouples we can see that in four of the modules we are well below uh, thermal runaway temperature and the result after this now we start flooding the water here. The result after this burn was that four out of six modules were no problem with them. So we both stopped the thermal runaway and the propagation of the thermal runaway, I should say. Uh, and we stopped the fire with this slow flow of uh, water. Uh, and, and what is good with water when flooding a battery is that it itself finds its way to the different uh, locations where it's needed. Of course, there, there might be battery configurations where it might not work, where we've had holes on the battery, burned holes during the, the thermal event. Liquid cooled batteries are batteries that are connected to a cooling system and the liquid is circulating within the cooling system and not directly to the batteries. 
And that means that it's a dry system and you don't have any use for that liquid from a firefighting perspective. However, the liquid cooling can be a good thing for preventing the spread, the propagation from one cell to another in the early stages of a fire. So module design and battery pack design are very important from a firefighting perspective if we're going to succeed or not. And depending on how they're designed, it will take very different times uh, from we start doing something until we see some success. This is an interesting video from Chris Hollis's Twitter account where they had a fire and they dumped the scooters in water and as you can see there will be bursts of flames underwater there we had one and that is a very good example of the oxides in the battery how they can sustain a fire underwater Talking about flooding with water, ways to extinguish or stop the propagation of the thermal runaway. The Renault is one of my favorite. It's so simple solution and it seems so effective. Where they have a fireman's access that burns hole under the back seat and you spray water down into the battery pack through the holes where you see the flames in the back seat. Easy and uh, efficient, it seems to me. The other one that is this kind of thing where you penetrate the battery pack. It was quite easy to handle and, and now we, we are not using it the way the, the manufacturer says because they are doing it another way but we just wanted to get a feel for it how easy it was to penetrate the metal and, and uh, see how the water flooded and brilliant but after this there have been some more uh, kinds of uh, solutions for this oh here's one more sh thing here what they do is they have a, a penetration that is stopped by this after a couple of centimeters or inches so you don't get too much of the nozzle inside the battery pack and destroy too many battery cells. This is the Rosenbauer extinguishing jack uh, which is designed to put under the vehicle and from a distance of eight meter you can raise the pike of, of the jack in so so it enters the battery pack and then you can flood it with water after that there is another one uh, from an austrian company avl uh, that is called the stingray one that basically does the same thing but from within the cabin you use the ceiling as uh, a hold against to uh, get the spike from the top down and into the battery and then you can flood it with water. This is Cold Cut Systems Cobra, the cutting extinguisher. And they are uh, on their way developing a method to use the Cobra to cut through the casing and get into the battery pack and flood it with water that way. I know of two different fire extinguishing agents for battery fires. One being F500EA, an encapsulating agent that also has a surface tension reducing property. And that property makes the water flow easier. So if you have batteries densely stacked, the water will get through faster and thereby cooling the other battery cells faster. But the main property of the agent is that it has a polar head and a non-polar tail and the polar head will stick to water molecules or water droplets and encapsulate them with the non-polar uh, tails sticking out from it and that in its turn will attract to the electrolyte the hydrocarbon and uh, forming a micelle around the hydrocarbon thereby uh, reducing the, the fire risk or uh, extinguishing the fire in the hydrocarbon. 
AVD, aqueous vermiculite dispersion, is the other agent I was thinking about. Here you can see it when we have a burning module, battery module, and it's a fixed system with AVD that started there. And it sprays the AVD dispersion on the battery module, and you can see it running, the brown stuff running on the module. And it's very efficient in cooling uh, the surrounding areas uh, from the battery fire and quenching the fire very good. Uh, since it's a cooling agent, it needs to get into in between the battery cells to prevent the spread from cell to cell. And it works with that in three ways. When you get it in between the cells, first you have the water in the uh, dispersion that evaporates and cools everything that is around it. Then you have chemically bonded water in the clay that uh, releases at a higher temperature, but also cools during that release. And finally, you get a small sheet of insulation when the clay is dried that in insulates from heat. So it works in, in several ways. Uh, and it's a very good agent, but it, you need to get it in between the cells to make a real good use of it. I spoke about uh, cold cut systems, and this is an interesting event in Germany where they used the cutting extinguisher to shoot and destroy the, the remaining battery cells. And uh, in that way they could finish the, the operation. I have spoken about flooding the battery now, and a method that is often suggested from car manufacturers are to uh, cool the outside of the battery pack. I would just like to make a short thought or share a short thought about that. A battery cell uh, with thermal runaway will have 900 degrees C or 1650F a long time, like minutes after they have had their thermal event. And it takes, if we say 180 degrees C, 350 degree F to start the thermal runaway uh, in these cells next to it. Uh, and we have heat transferring in, in the metal surrounding the cells. We have heat transferring from the flames and from the hot remains of the battery cell. We have heat transferring on top and down to cells. We have hot smoke that is forming and transferring heat to the, the cells. And all these things that we should, by spraying water on the outside and make that help to stop the propagation of the thermal runaway, is not very likely. There might be occasions when it's working, but I still haven't seen the evidence uh, that it works as a standard uh, method for handling battery fires. So, if we talk about extinguishment, Fire in battery packs can be stopped with water. External cooling might be useful sometimes, and at some scenarios, maybe. Uh, if you know something about this uh, that is scientific, please let me know. Battery design is crucial for success. Cell and module design decides if and how long it will take until we stop the thermal runaway or the propagation of the thermal runaway. And again, battery fires take time. Plan for that uh, and be patient. Uh, it will not be put out immediately many times. Now to fire blankets. Here are two fires, basically the same uh, modules uh, burning. Uh, and in one case, I'm going to put over a uh, fire blanket, the same kind that are made for cars. That's not the one here. Here it was a regular home fire blanket. And as you see, it, it lets smoke through compared to the car fire blanket, where we get smoke at the sides, but nothing coming through the, the fabric. The home fire blanket, it will also burn through. You will see that more closely in the next video. What you see here, however, when it pops is that the cells shooting away its content 
it's stopping them from shooting away. So in that way, a home fire blanket is a good protection for slowing the fire spread to other things. Here is another example of, of fire blankets. Below you see a home fire blanket and on top you see a car fire blanket. And now you see it's burning through the home fire blanket. But still, it's preventing battery cells from going away and spreading the fire that way. On the top, you can see that we put a fire hose around the burning battery modules uh, on top of the fire blanket. Uh, and we still got smoke on the outside. I think we need a larger volume where the smoke from the battery fires can it can be to get a smaller amount of smoke coming from the fire blanket, from under the fire blanket. This is an example of that. This is a cleaning machine. That kind of battery cell you see on fire on the bottom left is what we have under the fire blanket in that cleaning machine. The bottom right you see a smoke machine and we just do this for a demonstration to, to show how it works, where you put the fire blanket over the cleaning machine. And after a while, this smoke will have moved away. And very little smoke gets out to the outside. So that is a good way of, of dealing with uh, a battery fire and, and letting it burn finished under the fire blanket. During that time, you can work with ventilation to, to get as little smoke damages as you can if it's an indoor fire. As you see on the top, we have very little smoke, no flames, if you compare it with the bottom. Also interesting, when we remove the, the fire blanket from the cleaning machines, after the batteries were burnt out, the only thing that has been burning was the batteries. All the plastics in the cleaning machine was still unburnt, which means we have produced a lot less gases from that. Smoke. What is smoke? Well, the, the combustion products that are produced uh, from the battery fires, in the lower rectangle, we have a high concentration of that because in the upper rectangle we have had more uh, air mixed into the smoke plume and thereby uh, reducing the concentration. Uh, and if we have a fire blanket over something, then that smoke that can't get out will move down again and be entrained again in the smoke plume uh, and thereby concentrating it so it will have a higher level of the toxics in the smoke. But still, it will keep uh, a lot of smoke from coming out. And what I have learned about fire blankets during my tests are that battery fires require good fire blankets. And it is possible to reduce the amount of smoke with a good fire blanket. And the fire blanket reduces available oxygen for the fire and thereby reducing the burnt material under the, the blanket. And one lesson we learned from the cleaning machine fire was to keep the fire blanket on the machine for a long time. Because when we took off the, the blanket at one occasion, it started a new uh, thermal event in a new module that hadn't been damaged before. And that was like 20 minutes after the earlier uh, module was burning. So it will take time. And, and it's possible to work with ventilation during that uh, period of time. Also to have a plan when removing a fire blanket, have a plan and think that this will start again. If you do that, it's much easier to handle it when it happens or if it happens. The time for spread between modules can be very long. To protect exposures, is one way of handling a battery fire, letting the object itself burn and protecting what's around it. And, and there are several uh, different tools to do this. This is just to illustrate uh, how you can think. And this specific tool, we have a nozzle 
for each side of the burning vehicle and one for the ceiling above it. Uh, and in that way we can let the mid uh, vehicle burn and protect everything that is around it without spending too much time inside if it would be a garage fire. State of charge is important. In those three cases here I had 90% state of charge, 60 and 20. And I heated it with about 300 centigrades at the battery cell in all three cases. Uh, and if you look at the left one where we have all this bubbling and now there are flaming combustion. If we look in the middle we have a smoking combustion that is none of the combustion products were uh, burned so we would have a chance for an explosion in that case. And at the 20% state of charge it took 29 minutes before we finished the experiment and we haven't got more response from that battery cell than we have here. So it seems like state of charge is important. And it might be an important factor for determining the risk of ignition. If we have a car with 20% state of charge that have had a fire that is not in the battery pack, we could think that this will probably not extend to the battery pack. If we, on the other hand, have an 80% state of charge, that might be a problem. Uh, also, this might be an explanation for why seemingly identical fires gives a totally different result. You could have two car fires that have burned in the, the driver's compartment totally, and in one case it spread to the battery pack and the other it didn't state of charge might be an explanation for, for why it didn't uh, spread to the battery pack. And it seems like 30% is an important state of charge. I'm not exactly sure uh, how to use this, but, but I think there is a lot to learn more about this with state of charge and, and how we can use that. How the fire start is a very important factor in how the battery fire will turn out. For example, if you have an external short circuit with external heating, that fire will start depending on how many battery cells it's heating up. If it's one cell, it will be a slow starting fire. If it's many cells, it will be a faster growing fire. If we have a short circuit in one cell, that will give a slow starting fire with a, with a one cell start and then spreading, propagating to, to the other cells. On the other hand, if it was a short circuit of all cells, then we will have heating of all cells and maybe a start of the, the fire about the same time. If we have an external heat source, same thing there. How many battery cells is exposed? Is it one cell? Then it is a slow starting fire and if it's several cells it will be a faster starting fire. Cell failure will most likely only happen to one cell at a time and in that case it will be a slow starting fire. One thermal event in one cell and then the heating will start of the cells surrounding it and then we will have the propagation that way. Mechanical damage on cells, same thing, say a car accident. Is it a mechanical damage on one cell? It might be a slow starting fire. If it's several cells, it will be uh, faster. Uh, and same thing on module level and pack level. If we have a mechanical damage on one module, that will probably be, be uh, much worse than if it's only one cell. And same thing with pack. Uh, and overcharging is another uh, one of those uh, bad scenarios because then you will have all cell at the level that they're just waiting for an excuse to, to start a thermal runaway. And uh, when you get a thermal runaway in the first cell, the adjoining cells uh, will likely be very close to starting a thermal runaway in them as well. 
Uh, and one thing I don't have an image for here is is uh, the the uh, scenario where you uh, flood the battery pack with salt water to start a short circuit in the cells to heat the cells up. That is a scenario where you start several cells uh, at one time. That will be a completely different scenario than having one cell start and that might be good to know when doing fire testing of of cells it is important how you start the fire one question that is still a problem is that battery fires can reignite after up to a week or maybe more after the initial fire uh, and as I see it, there could be two reasons for this. Uh, one is that is a chemical thing within the battery. If a battery cell have been heated up to a certain temperature, that would uh, make them like unstable and unable to, to start a chemical process even after they have been cooled. The other thing would be if it's an uh, electrical short circuit that heats up the fire residues and thereby heating up other unscathed battery cells uh, and causing them to burn again and, and thereby creating a propagation of a thermal runaway. And I've spoken to a couple of battery experts about this and the people I've spoken with thinks it's more like the later, that it's short circuiting, heating up the fire residues. And if that is the case, I believe we need more knowledge here, but if, if that is the case, that it is short circuits, then it would be a easy fix, not easy in that way, we, but we would know what we need to do because we would need to drain the batteries on all the energy after the fire is out and then we would have no problem. And in Sweden here, I know we have some recycling companies doing that and you, you probably have that in other parts of the world as well, making them de-energized by flooding them with the salt solution to, to get rid of the, the energy left in, in the batteries. Smoke fill from battery fires can look very different. In this first case, we have the electrical scooter that is on charge and you see that it's a very rapid smoke fill in those images. Uh, and on the other side, we have this battery fire where we don't get that fast smoke filling. And that is interesting. I think we have a lot to learn here still. And I think that it's because there are so many variables that gives large variations in fire scenarios. For example, state of charge, the cause of the fire and the battery design are just a few of them. And we do still have a lot to learn. Uh, and one of the keys for learning more and faster is incident reporting and uh, fire investigations, where you write detailed descriptions uh, of what was going on. And if you have a, a state government or someone looking into battery fires, send it in to them so they can take part of what you have learned. And in that way we all can learn faster. Skin penetration of hydrogen fluoride have been a concern here in Sweden for a number of years now. Uh, in 2016, the Swedish Defense Research Organization uh, made a study where they said that uh, putting out fires on the outside of a car fire was fine, but not on the inside, uh, like interior. In uh, 2018, they made a new study that said that 20 minutes are okay, but after that you should go out if you're doing interior firefighting on a car fire. Uh, and last year, 2021, they made an even deeper study where they had uh, live HF testing with firefighters and measuring the amount of HF penetrated uh, the turnout gear. Uh, and they also measured on human skin how much hydrogen fluoride that penetrated the skin and how fast. 
And they concluded that a one hour interior firefighting is no problem if you decontaminate after firefighting. I will add a link in the description of the video to the decontamination procedure that they are talking about in that case. But that was good news. If we want to detect if there are any dangerous gases present from a battery fire, I have spoken to several battery experts and they all say that carbon monoxide is a very good gas to detect because it starts to produce early and it lasts even after the battery fire seems to be out, there is a lot of carbon monoxide produced. So by indicating or detecting carbon monoxide, you are very well taken care of. Thank you for listening. My regular work is to find interesting and useful information for Swedish and Scandinavian fire brigades. Uh, and if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate if you took a few minutes thinking if you have any kind of information, standard operating procedures, inventions you have made at your fire brigade, and send that information to me at po at utkiken.net. And I will be happy to share that with the Swedish and Scandinavian brigades that have uh, sponsored this uh, video. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.